lessons learned along the way. That's what we've been looking at. Uh, I'm getting a little echo, I believe, at this time. Okay. Lessons learned along the way. Uh, actually, I should have entitled it Lessons Learning Along the Way. As my friend wrote that book, The Making of a Leader, and he had it published by NAF Press, he said the reason he entitled it The Making of a Leader instead of a made leader is because a leader is never made. He's always in the making. And I think if we would learn that, that would look to do us in good stead. But because of that, I have uh, two pieces of literature that I will pass to you, and you can pick them up between the sessions, uh, that uh, when we think about the fact that we're all leaders and we're still learning. Uh, one is called Principles of the Bottom Line. This is a synopsis of Warren Wiersbe's uh, from Leadership, Volume 1, Number 1 on principles of the bottom line. I had the privilege of spending a week with uh, Warren Wiersbe, and he said these principles have been guiding him for almost 25 years when he wrote the article, and it's been almost 25 years since he wrote the article. I said, are these principles still guiding you? And he said, they still are. And, and he also said, pick up my book and you'll see. And he has a little book out called On Being a Servant of God, and those principles are listed here. So you can pick up a copy of that. I also have uh, printed literature here called Christian Leadership, What Makes Leadership Christian? It is in print. It's uh, Bibliotheca Sacra. I think it's 1987 or 1989. Uh, and I think that would be good for us to look at. But uh, there for you to pick up between the sessions. We looked yesterday the Old Testament, both the morning and the afternoon, past lessons uh, learned along the way. In the morning from the Old Testament, past encouragements. In the afternoon, past experiences. And some of you have picked them up and you're still asking me about these. Uh, you may pick them up, but we still have some around here, but it's going to look like a DNA uh, chart. You will have to get someone to fill it in for you or else perhaps purchase the... Uh, the cassette because uh, living between the now and the not yet uh, beloved now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet and we looked at uh, the fugitive years of David and drew some principles that even though hell sees in our lifetime heaven speaks as well uh, you can pick that up a very perceptive question was asked at the end of the session yesterday and I tried to address that afterwards we also spoke yesterday afternoon uh, from the Old Testament past experiences. Uh, what Joshua became publicly in Joshua, Joshua was becoming privately in the Pentateuch. And you can pick this up, but you'll still have to have someone to fill it in for you or else purchase the cassette. Uh, these are just synopsis of series that I've shared. And a very perceptive question was asked yesterday afternoon. At what point do we expect to move from between Pentateuch in the book of Joshua. It says what Joshua became publicly in Joshua, Joshua was becoming privately in the Pentateuch. I have uh, two answers to that. Uh, one is I wouldn't worry about moving too quickly from the Pentateuch to the book of Joshua, at least as far as your leadership life. You know, some people are concerned, I want to be like Joshua and Joshua. But you need Joshua in the Pentateuch as well. He had a history in the book of uh, uh, Exodus on before the book of Joshua. But a second thing is this. I think the Lord is looking for that one criteria that we looked at. Uh, remember, Joshua was one of the few with enough spiritual sense to recognize the source of Moses' strength. And he really needed to, to learn that because remember what we shared about Joshua yesterday? Joshua could have claimed, hey, listen, I'm the 11th or 12th descendant of Joseph. I've got the blood of Joseph in my veins. I feel leadership coming upon me. Or he could have said, I'm of the tribe of Ephraim. And Ephraim, they challenged Judah for the limelight. And it says in Genesis where it says uh, that the arms and hands of Ephraim will be made strong by the touch of the hands of God. And he could have said, the hand of God's on my tribe. I feel like leadership coming upon me. 
or he could have he could have said Elisha is my grandfather he's my granddaddy I got something to say he's my granddaddy that never qualifies anybody by the way you know that just doesn't qualify just because they're your granddaddy our, our daddy but see Elisha was the one when they went out he led all of the tribe of Ephraim 40,500 and I'm sure Joshua could have said that's my granddaddy that's my granddaddy I've got something to say well he didn't have anything to say now maybe his daddy and granddaddy had something to say but you know uh, none was his father who was the eldest son and Joshua was the eldest son he could have said man I'm somebody I've got something to say the whole Passover was built around me given so that I might be spared I've got something to say but no I think Joshua moved from the Pentateuch to the book of Joshua when he understood that uh, the real source of strength in uh, Moses life because in Joshua 1 5 it says this the Lord said to Joshua as I was with Moses so will I be with you and that's the key because people paraded remember what Howard Hendricks said we are a crippling Christian community by parading big names across the platform as though that's that's what we do in John 6 I think it's John 6 32 remember all the people said hey Jesus let's see what you do what Moses did you're just feeding us right here why don't you feed us like Moses did he fed the millions with bread from heaven and he did it for 40 years and Jesus gave a very astute statement that I think Joshua recognized. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses did not give you that bread, but my father. And I think Joshua understood that. And I believe we move from the Pentateuch time of our life to the Joshua time in our life. What is the old adage that goes like this? We will never become strong until we draw from a stronger source and we will never draw from a stronger source until we sense our own weakness we never get out of date by singing that song I need thee every hour okay so that's I hope that's that's an answer for the perceptive question yesterday Okay, lessons learned along the way or learning lessons along the way, and this is just a synopsis of a series. We're in John 13 through 17. I'm sorry I didn't give you the, the printed printout today where you could write yesterday twice. I just ran out of steam last night. And uh, so get, get the cassette, that's okay. I just, I just ran out of steam, and my secretary ran out of steam too. <laughs> Lessons learned along the way, a New Testament perspective encouragement. Are you hearing me okay? Is it coming along? Okay, good. I was walking through the den one day and my wife said, come here, take a look here on TV. And that's always the trouble for me because usually when she says that, it's one of these things that will tear your heart out. And, uh, and it was. It's one of these true things on TV. And I sat down and it tore my heart out. It was called, Who Will Care for My Children? The Children of Lucille Frey. Lucy Frey. I think she lived in Kansas, somewhere out in the Midwest. And I say to my wife, why do you do this to me? Why do you always call me in and sit me down here to look at these things that tear my heart out? And what it was, it was the life of a mother who was passing away with cancer. And she was trying to provide housing for her children before she passed away. And she had six children. And we'll go back to the early 1950s. I think you can get that book today called The Children of Lucy Frey, or Lucille Frey. And she found a home for one and for two and for three and for four and for five. And she only had one to go. And this was the kind of the sad sack of the family. This one had epilepsy and, and she couldn't find a home for him and she died. Man, my, I mean, it tore my heart in two. And she died. And this is one child without a home provided. 
who will care for my children? Well, we have in this passage here, if you will look with me at John chapter 13 and verse 33. John 13 and verse 33. Little children. These are the words of Jesus. He's sharing them with his own chosen ones. By the way, this word technion is, except for Galatians 4.19, the only time you find it written will be in the Gospel of John or the Epistles of John. It's a dear term. Technion. Little children. Little children. Now what Jesus will do in John 13 through 17 is this. He wants to assure his own that despite his departure, every contingency has been perceived and planned for. So that if you were to ask the question, who will care for my children? It would not be the same results as it was with Lucy Frey. I was able to care for all of my children but one. Jesus would be able to say, of all the ones that thou hast given me, I've lost none. I've lost none. And uh, this is such a special passage. And as I said, this is a series for me, but it comes from several sermons. I'm going to try to tie it together in a single thought. But little children, despite my departure, every contingency has been prepared and perceived and planned for for you. And he's so calm, so calm. I don't have time to look at this, but if you would just put down John 14, verses 28 through 31, you will see how calm the Lord Jesus is. This is the night just before he's going to be betrayed and handed over and, and be brought before the trial and crucified. But John 14, 28 through 31, he would say, I'd like to share with you my fullness of joy. I would like for your faith to be strengthened. I would like to silence the foe. I would like for the world to know my faithfulness to be shown that as the Father hath given me commandment, thus I do, let us arise and go hence. Man, he was so calm. It kind of reminded me of the time my wife and I packed up and we moved 500 miles away to go to one of the seminaries and we left my mother in the hospital over in Greensboro and she'd been in and out of the hospital for six months and it was kind of a tough thing knowing that you may not ever see her again on this earth. And she'd gone from 140 pounds to about 70 some pounds. And we said farewell to her and took off 500 miles. I'd been there two weeks and got a telephone call and the doctor said, we've got to do something. She's going to die if we don't do something. So they were going to do exploratory surgery. So we drove all that evening, got back down here. And early before the surgery, all of the family gathered around her bed. And then the pastor, and you should know this pastor, he's one of these pastors that really kind of pulls at your heart. You know, he cries, and it pulls everybody else into crying as well. So he said, let's have prayer. So here we were, my father, my sister, my brother, myself, I think uh, our mates, and the pastor at the end of the bed, and so he started praying. He broke down and started crying. Well, you know what that did to the rest of us. And so, I mean, so when, we, when he finally said amen and we all opened our eyes, here was my mother lying in the midst of all of this going on, up on her elbows, chiding us for our lack of faith. And she's the one that we're crying about, and she's the one that is consoling us. And get the same imagery of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, these disciples were terrified and troubled and torn with grief. And it's like the Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night before of his death, you know, when he knew that it was time for him in John 13, 1, that he should go out of the world back to his father, and having loved his own, he loved them to the end or to the uttermost degree. Up to the last point, he expressed his love. Well, with that, a little bit of background, a little bit more background I want to share with you, that uh, these disciples were feeling abandoned by Christ, and they were feeling alienated from civilization. Jesus had said, I'm going away by death. But he also said that uh, Satan is coming to destroy you. Now, can you, can you see that? 
They felt abandoned by Christ. They felt alienated from civilization. Jesus said, I'm going away by death. He said that the evil one is coming to destroy you. They felt like that they had burned their bridges and blown up their boats, and they had nowhere to go. Jesus also said, one of you would disown me. Do you know every last one of them denied it? Jesus said, one of you will deny me. Do you know every last one of them denied it? In fact, so strongly did Peter deny it in John 13 that Peter said, Lord, my very life I give for you. And Jesus said, your very life you give for me? Peter, I would say unto you, it is impossible for this elector, this cock to crow, until you have denied me thrice. And boy, you're talking about uh, burst in the bubble. And not only did he say one would disown him, one would deny him, all would desert him. So we're getting the background. Look with me at John 14, 1. He said this, I perceive that you have troubled hearts. Look with me at John 14, 27. I perceive that you have terrified hearts. Look with me at John 16, 6. I perceive that your hearts are torn with grief. Now let's put it all together. They feel abandoned by Christ. They feel alienated from civilization. Jesus said, I'm going away by death. Jesus said that the evil one is coming to destroy you. Jesus said, one of you would disown me. One of you would deny me. All of you will desert me. Their hearts were troubled. Their hearts were terrified. Their hearts were torn by grief. But between the going away and the coming again, Jesus does something very special. You may want to take these passages down. We will not look at them all. But if we ever know why a passage was written, this perhaps gives us a better understanding than any other passage. Because on several occasions, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you. Now, if you will look at the verses just preceding each of those times he says that, it will tell you what he said. First, he said, these things have I spoken unto you, 1425. Next, these things have I spoken unto you, 1511. Next, these things have I spoken unto you, 161. Next, these things have I spoken unto you, 164. Next, these things have I spoken unto you, 1625. Next, these things have I spoken unto you, 1633. Now, they should not go away. I wonder why he spoke those things unto us. Well, he told them that many times why he said those things to them. This is what I would like to encourage all of our hearts at this point. Perspective encouragement. You may expect. Now, not all of these, these things have I spoken to you are on equal footing as far as the outlines. But I'm going to choose four. First, Jesus said, you may expect a life of support. Despite my departure, every contingency has been perceived and planned for, and you may expect a life of support. Look with me at 1425 for a moment. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. The whole context, these things that he's been talking about is not the fact that he's present with them, but that he won't be present with them much longer, but not to worry. He will say, look, you may expect support in your work, 
1412, in the words 1626, 1426 and 1614, and in your witness, 15 and 16, suppose we faint, suppose we forget it, suppose we falter. Uh, sometimes I think about that. Do you not think about this? Lord, I, I feel like I'm going to blow it. <laughs> Good. I think we ought to think about that. We don't want to be like on the Andy Griffith show, and you know that I'm, I'm a fan of Andy Griffith. I showed that with you yesterday. He was brought up, by the way, up here in Mount Airy, North Carolina. That's Mayberry, if you're close by here. But old Goober, you know, Goober and Gomer, the cousins. Old Goober, he went to the shooting gallery at the county fair one time. He was going to win this for Opie. And old, old Goober stepped right up, confident, took his gun. Bang! 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 Put the gun down, held out his hand for the prize. And the guy said, you missed every one. And he was shocked because he was so sure that there was no way he was going to blow it. But sometimes you get, uh, you know, on Sunday nights, I think, good night. I feel like I've told them everything I know, and I've got to turn right around and tell them something more next Sunday. <laughs> and, uh, and you do this every week. <laughs> Every week, who was it? The one pastor said, I feel like I'm telling about 95% fact and about 95, about 5% guess. And then you go again at it next week. I feel like I'm going to blow it. But Jesus assured his disciples, you may sense you will fail, forget, be frustrated and fatigued, but you may anticipate a life of support so much so that would you look with me at John chapter 14 and verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. Let me give you the Greek word. You ready? See what it sounds like. Orphanus. Orphans. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphan." Now, sometimes we think we feel so all alone in our ministry. But Jesus said, I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you. In fact, you must understand, and I'm not trying to confuse uh, omnipresence and residence and indwelling, but all three members of the Godhead have a personal relationship with us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three you can find from Scripture that have an intricate relationship within you right at this point. Not just God the Holy Spirit, although he has a unique indwelling principle, but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three at this point, maintain a unique relationship with us. I will not leave you orphaned. You may expect a life of support. Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata. I'm grateful she was able to say this because I think when she said it, it brings it a little bit more powerful punch to it. You know, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, you know, the uh, paraplegic. She said, I have learned this. You can have everything but Jesus Christ and you have nothing. On the other hand, in my case, you can have nothing but Jesus Christ, and you have everything. Now, it needed to come from her to give that powerful punch, and I am so grateful for that. Let me give you a verse. Don't look at it, but just listen to this. In John 16, 7, Jesus said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is truth. It is expedient for you. It is necessary. It is so needed. It is vital that I go away. Isn't that something? It is expedient for you that I go away. You know, they needed Jesus' physical absence more than they needed Jesus' physical presence. You say, man, I can't believe that. Because you hear a lot of people saying, man, if I could only see Jesus, I'd really live for him. 
there were many that saw him with the physical eye and they did not live for him but there have been many more that have never seen Jesus with the physical eye and have lived with him why did Jesus say it is expedient for you that I go away this is truth because they needed not just to have Jesus with them they needed to have Jesus give me the preposition in them Richard Halverson the chaplain of the United States Senate he just passed away recently when he was appointed to that position he said this I felt like a non-person I felt like I was just going to be a puny mascot to the most powerful body of rulers in the world before the 100 members of the United States Senate and I felt like a non-person in a powerful body so he went home and that evening he had in his devotions this passage all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me and lo I am with you so the next morning which was the first day that he went to work as chaplain of the United States Senate this is what he said I feel like a garment that Jesus Christ wears every day to do what he wants to do he does not need my strength my weakness will do as long as I'm surrendered to him Amen. Jesus said you may expect that you may expect a life of support number two John chapter 15 and verse 11 and I'm just covering four of these these things have I spoken unto you you may expect a life of shared joy shared joy John 15 and verse 11 look with me these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full uh, let me give you something to write do you know in the passages before us it speaks of Jesus saying I want to give you my peace 1427 you want to write it down my peace 1427 my love 1510 my joy 1511 my joy 1511 now watch this did you know that contrary to that do you know that the world has peace too 1427 do you know that the world has love too? 1519? Do you know that the world has joy too? 1620? But Jesus said, I'm going to give you a life of sharing with me my peace, my love, and my joy. Not the world's peace and love and joy, but mine. And you may expect that. You may anticipate that. I have not left you, John 15, 18. What's the word? Orphans. I will come to you. You may expect a life of support. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain with you. You might expect a life of shared joy. Let me share something with you. When was Jesus Christ experience in his greatest joy he was a very joyful individual by the way you understand that the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5 are nothing more than characteristics of the life of our Lord as he walked upon the earth and as the Spirit of God produces these elements in our own life all we're doing is producing that which was shown forth by the Lord Jesus Christ as he traveled upon this earth and he was a very joyful person who was it Howard Hendricks said I'm afraid that one day when we get to heaven the Lord's going to put his arm around us and say gee I'm no, I don't mean that word but that's the way he said it he said uh, say I'm, I'm so sorry that you had such a, a sad time upon the earth <laughs> I meant for it to be a little bit better than that but he said uh, you may expect a life of shared joy uh, when was Jesus most joyful I think we can say this I delight to do thy will, O Lord. 
I delight to do thy will, O Lord. I don't think this shared joy is just an automatic, but we can anticipate and expect it. The sweetest moments of my life are when I give obedience to God, to the glory of God. I think that's been the greatest joy in my life when I sense that I'm obeying him. Contrarywise, I think that no one is more miserable than a Christian who for a time hedges on his obedience. He does not love sin enough to enjoy its pleasure, but neither does he love the Savior enough to enjoy his person. He doesn't feel at home in heaven or in earth. But if we fulfill what he's talking about in this John 15, I think he's saying you may expect a life of shared joy. Number three, chapter 16 and verse 1. You may anticipate a life of struggle. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended, scandalized. Now, I, I certainly appreciate the, the order here. <laughs> I appreciate that he first said you may expect a life of support because uh, when I go out on that field I want to know he's with me and when I go out on that field I want to know that there's something special within me too that I can share his joy and it's good to know these things before he tells us these things have I spoken unto you you might expect a life of struggle you know, who was it? Was it pliable in Pilgrim's Progress when he turned to, to Pilgrim and said, is this the happiness you promised me of? And he turned around and went back. A life of struggle. Now, I, all of the passages, verses around there tell you why. But uh, let me just illustrate it this way. I was a very shy person, still am a very shy person, but when I was in junior high school, I think in the eighth grade, I broke down and sent Valentine candy in a card to the most beautiful girl in the eighth grade. Her name was Jeannie. I dream of Jeannie. She had the dark brown hair. And I, I gave her my love. I mean, that was really something for me to do that. And a card and some candy. And I got on the school bus that evening, and we were pulling off, and I saw Jeannie. And she was with her boyfriend. And they were sharing my candy. <laughs> and they were snickering over my card. Now, can you imagine how I felt? I mean, that crushed me. That absolutely crushed me. What Jesus is saying is this. You will share your candy of love with the world. And you will write a card saying, I love you. And they will take that and share it with one another and snicker at you. And he said, I'm telling you this so that you will not be offended. You see the word in 16.1? It's the word skandalizomai that you will not be scandalized. Bold print, you may expect a life of struggle. And uh, that is indeed, uh, I'll tell you that one of the most powerful books I have read recently, well recently, <laughs> 15 years ago, <laughs> Kifa Sempangi, in the reign of Idi Amin in Uganda, called A Distant Grief. To me, that, that capitalizes what this life of struggle was all about. Would you mark with me just a few things? I'm going to give credit to Vance Havner, who is, as I said yesterday, lived not far from this year over in Greensboro, and Dr. Stevens used to have him here all the time years ago. But would you just mark with me a couple of things in John chapter 17 in Jesus' prayer? In verse... Uh, Six, would you just mark with me, this is, this is Vance Havner's, only he could do it. In John 17 in verse 6, underline the phrase, out of the world. I 
in verse 11, would you mark the phrase the second time it occurs in the world? Would you in verse 14 mark the phrase not of the world? In verse 15, would you mark the phrase I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world? And in verse 18, would you mark the phrase, sent them into the world? And when Vance Havner used to preach it, it would go like this. Let me see if I can get it right. We have been saved out of the world. We're still in the world, but we're not of the world. I have not prayed that they would be taken out of the world, but I have prayed that they would be sent back into the world to call others out of the world, and that's the only reason that we have for being in this world. And he used to preach that, and I mean, it was, the way he would preach that was pretty powerful. But what he's saying is this, you must understand to expect a life of struggle in some extent. That's the third thing. Let's move on to the fourth one. A life of support, John 14, 25. A life of shared joy, John 15, 11. A life of struggle, John 16, 1. And then a life of security, John 16, 33. Let's look at 16, 33 and the parts around it. <clears throat> These things have I spoken unto you, that in me, now you want to circle the phrase, in me, that in me ye might have peace. And then you want to circle the phrase, in the world, in the world ye shall have tribulation. I'll stop with that just for a moment. And then he goes on to say, but be of good cheer. A life of security. Um, in me, in the world. You see that little word, that little phrase, be of good cheer? The only time that was ever used in the New Testament, tharseo, the only time it was used was by Jesus or one time it was used by some others that were telling one be of good cheer he's coming you know what that says to me when it comes right down to it Jesus is the only one who can say to our hearts cheer up be of good courage you appreciate it from your brothers and sisters in Christ but when you know the Lord Jesus Christ is saying it to you it must mean something very wonderful. Be of good cheer. Be of good courage. A life of security. Let's, let's read the context here. <clears throat> In uh, verse 29, watch this. His disciples said unto him, we've got it. See, throughout, in John 14, they asked him several questions, and they wouldn't ask him any more questions, and Jesus says, why don't you ask me questions? And they kept going back and forth, and, and then his disciples said in verse 29 of John 16, we got it. We got it. We, we understand. Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask this. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Verse 31, Jesus said in paraphrase, you got it? You really think you got it? So they come to the end of John 13 through 16 here, and, and they say, we got it. And Jesus said, you got it? He said, we got it, we got it. Look at the next verse, verse 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I mean, they'd finally crawled up to the very top of the mountain top there, and they, they think, we finally have arrived, and we've got it. And they turn to Jesus, and they say, we got it. And Jesus said, you got it? You're going to go tumbling down that mountain, before long. Can you imagine how they felt just then? But Jesus said, 
not to worry. Because he comes right back in verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulations, but cheer up. I have overcome the world. The bottom line is this. You will lose many battles, but not to worry. I have won the war. Now let that sink in just for a moment. When I think of living between the time that Jesus goes away and comes again, he says, I'm giving you to expect a life of support and a life of shared joy, but a life of struggle, and we're going to blow it, and we're going to lose many battles. Jesus said not to worry. You will lose many battles, but I will win the war. And he says that because in verse 33, the end of that, I have overcome the world. Ne nikao. What's a very popular tennis shoe that you, that you wear? Nikes. You know what Nikes means? Victory. Conqueror. That's what the, the Nike shoe, most people don't know that. They, they buy the shoe because of the name brand, but Nike means victory, conqueror. And, uh, and so people buy them, and, and they don't know why they do that. Jesus said this, not only I will conquer, he gave this of such a certainty, he says, I have conquered the world. You will lose the battle. You will lose many battles. You're going to blow it. But I will win the war. By the way, in Romans 8, is it 37 or 39, it says this, that we're more than conquerors. You know what that is in the Greek? Hoopernikes. We're hooperniks, more than conquerors. <laughs> Abundant conquerors through him. Super conquerors, if you please. And uh, he said, I want you to anticipate a life of security. I have overcome the world. Sometimes as we go through the fact of living between the now and the not yet, it is good to know, I know, that we may expect a life of support. And I, like you, many times ask this question, Lord, where are you? <laughs> Even when you're not, you know. And then uh, to understand the fact that we may expect a life of shared joy. And sometimes I, like you, will ask, Lord, where's the joy? Very seldom do I ask when struggle comes, Lord, where's the struggle? I know where the struggle is at. But then again, the Lord says, you may expect a life of security. For I will not walk away from you, and I do not want to walk away from you, and I will not leave you comfortless or the orphanus. I will come to you. When, uh, when I was a kid, there were two groups in our community, the older ones and the younger ones, are those my age. And with a lot of kids in our, I mean, all over our neighborhood, and we play sports at different seasons of the year. And uh, if I would play with people my age or younger, I'd do okay. I'd be picked high in the draft. But sometimes I would want to play with the kids older than me, and I'd go down to the sand lot and choose up. And there was this one guy, and his name was Mike. You know, the kind that you would call Mikey. It's the butch. You know, you, you call the bullies butch. He was a butch. He was Mikey. And I'd show up. He said, what are you doing here? And he's older than me. You know, he's, I'm maybe like sixth grade. He's in eighth or ninth grade. You know, what are you doing here? Why have you come? You're not going to play. So he'd be one of the captains and somebody else would be the other captain. And we'd all you know, choose up teams. And I would be the last one chosen. <laughs> Uh, if I was chosen at all. They'd finish up and say, okay, you got Fulton. One day, Billy Brammer came. Billy Brammer played high school baseball for Moorhead High School. He lived in our community too, but he never often was around us because, you know, he, he offered the baseball team and stuff like that. And so he comes in and he said to Mike, he said, okay, Stanley, you and I are going to be captains. Now, I was, I was so excited just because he, he spoke up to, to Mike and said, we're going to be captains. And he said, I'm going to choose first, Mike. You got any questions? 
It was great. Man, I thought, I don't care if I'm chosen or not, that it's been a victorious day. <laughs> so Billy chose, and he said, uh, I get first choice. He said, I'm taking uh, Fulton. I thought, I can't believe this. He's going to choose me. And he chose me. And we beat Mike's team that day. Let me tell you something. He really didn't choose me for my strength. He really didn't even choose me for my weakness. The wonder of his choice was based upon his strength. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who promises us this life of security, the one who can take the five loaves and the two fishes, and the one who can take the two mites, and the one who can take the very stones of the ground, or the mouth of babes, are treasures in earthen clay pots. And you and me, and who could say, you're going to lose many battles, but I have won the war, is great encouragement and security. And I close with this just to let you know, and Jesus wants us to know. 1980, when the U.S. played the USSR in ice hockey, remember over in, in Europe? And that night it was going to be on TV, and the Russians were favored to win over the Americans. That morning, I somehow cut the radio on and got the word that the USA had defeated the USSR in ice hockey. And I knew it. Nobody else knew it. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell our friends, Larry and Gail Witt. I didn't tell anyone. We we're going to watch it that night together. And I thought, I can't believe this. I know who's going to win. So we sat down that night and watched. And I thought, man, did I hear this right? Because if you remember that game, I still thought, I thought, it's not going to come out on TV the way it came out on radio. <laughs> we're going to lose this thing. This was in the semifinal game. And I thought, we're, we're, and I was, you know, Tim Darnold talking about how his hands will, you know, be like that cold and clammy. I thought, we're going to lose this game. And we won. You and I sometimes said, are of Christ, man, we, we're blowing it. We're going to lose this thing. But we have the promise of the Lord who says, be of good cheer. I have conquered the world in his name. Let's bow in prayer.